What are some of the things that you kind of see from a loan officer perspective? And what are some of the things that maybe the bank looks for if somebody is going to finance a piece of land through the U.S. bank? So what you said is is exactly what happens. There's some real estate agents that are really savvy with, with lot and land, um, buying and selling and helping their clients. If a real estate agent wants to call me, I'm happy to walk them through what we look for. Typically, we need to find a piece of property. It needs to be less than 10 acres. So if you come and say, hey, we've got 75 acres, we want to build a home, our lot loan is not the program. Hi, everybody. Jose Luis Morales here. Welcome back. Today, we have a return guest. Her name is Laura Fisher. Uh, she works for U.S. Bank. The last time she was on the show, she talked to us about how to get a construction loan. She talked to us about building versus buying a home. And we also talked about whether it was cheaper to build uh, to buy a home already built or to build one from scratch. Welcome back to the show, Laura. How are you? Thank you. I'm well. How are you, Jose Luis? Good I'm to see you. Excited to, I'm excited to, to have you back on the show. So for our viewers that didn't watch the first episode, who is Laura Fisher and how did you get involved in this wonderful world of uh, real estate, land, loans? Land, loans, and construction. So I've been with U.S. Bank over eight years in uh, mortgage lending. And one of the great products that U.S. Bank offers is construction lending. So I became construction certified. I actually have been in banking uh, probably close to 25 years. Mm -hmm. The construction lending probably 20 years ago before the mortgage meltdown. Things have changed significantly since that time. But um, yeah, U.S. Bank, like it here, it's a great, great company. And like our construction lending, um, another thing about myself, I'm on the board of our local chapter of Habitat for Humanity. That's awesome. I'm yeah. glad to hear that. Cool. Um, so the reason I like having you on the show is because one, not all banks do construction loans and two, not all banks are specialists in construction loans. So I wanted to have you back just because obviously you are that specialist. You are that person that does a high volume of them for our viewers that are considering purchasing a piece of land and maybe building their dream dream home on it. How does that process work? How does somebody get started with that? And if you could walk us through that, that would be amazing. Yeah. Well, the first thing I want to say is I think it's a big mis misconception. Um, really trying to educate real estate agents as well is that there is lot or land lending available. So lot loans, uh, lot lending for residential um to build a residential home. So US Bank has a fantastic lot loan program. It's um, three one arm, it's a loan amortized over 30 years. Interest rate is fixed for three years, goes adjustable in year four. No balloon payment, uh, no prepayment penalty. Also can, um, you can put as little as 20% down for the lot, for the land. So this is a loan to acquire the piece of land, basically. Mm -hmm. And like, let's say that they do use the the three uh, one arm. Is that loan specifically because almost we think that it's going to take approximately three years to get permits on that. And it's kind of like a shorter term type of loan. And then it kind of allows you to get into construction at that point. Or what's what's the purpose of the three one arm? So that gives the, the buyer three years to go get their plans, permits, come back, come back to U.S. Bank, apply for the construction loan. The construction loan is going to pay off the lot loan at that time. So what happens is um, sometimes, you know, baby boomers buy it and they think they're going to build in five to 10 years. They can let that loan adjust every year. U.S. Bank doesn't have a requirement saying you have to build or you have to get permits. Your, your hands are not tied. You can do what you want with that, with that property. Um, you can come back, refinance, fix for another three years, or you can let it adjust every year. So, so right now, as of today, interest rate on that is right around 7%, fixed for three years, adjustable in year four. Basically, if somebody wants to acquire a piece of land, it doesn't require that you build on it immediately. It's just a loan mm -hmm. for a piece of land, basically. Now, if somebody wanted to purchase a piece of land, like what should they be looking for? Like I know even as a real estate agent, because I don't do as many land deals as maybe somebody like you, like um, it's our utilities there. Um, is it, uh, is it going to require a lot of grading? 
um is it is it is 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 the land clean meaning is it, it do we need to do an environment report what are some of the things that you kind of see from a loan officer perspective and what are some of the things that maybe the bank looks for if somebody is going to finance a piece of land through u.s bank so what you said is is exactly what happens there's some real estate agents that are really savvy with with lot and land um buying and selling and helping their clients if a real estate agent wants to call me i'm happy to walk them through what we look for typically we need to find a piece of property it needs to be less than 10 acres so if you come and say hey we've got 75 acres we want to build a home our lot loan is not the program so a couple two things that are really important if you find a piece of land that's in an existing subdivision most likely it's going to have access to electricity and um, your city or county water, you're fine. If you purchase a property, Montecito, San Ynez, somewhere in the mountains, and there's not a lot of homes, um, and you're gonna need to, to put a sewer, sewer system in, we'll need what's called a percolation test, perk test. So that's one of the things that the bank requires. That also drops your loan to value about 5%. Uh, what is it again, a percolation? So percolate yeah, percolation tests. So that's for the septic tank. So they want to see how the water settles. So it has to, to settle at a certain rate um, so that it can accommodate uh, the um, septic tank. And then uh, let's say that somebody does want to build on that uh, lot at that point. And let's say during the three-year arm, they're getting the approval appropriate permits. And then let's say that they do get the appropriate permits. What's the next step? Like, do they apply for a construction loan? And does U.S. Bank do those type of loans as well too? Right. So you come back and you apply for the construction loan. Again, it pays off the lot loan. I tell all my clients to apply 90 days prior to breaking ground. Uh, that way we get you credit approved, we get the appraisal ordered. We do everything with the builder that we need. We make sure the builder's on our approve list. Um, we get the, the building estimate, the materials list. We get you teed up and, and ready. And we actually can get loan approval without the permits. You can't start building unless, until you have your permits, but we can still get our loan process through. And how does that work if you don't have the permits approved? Does that like lock in the interest rate at all? Or uh, you just have loan approval and it doesn't close until you get your approved permits. And how would that process work? Let's say the permits take like a, a year or a year and a half. Right. So they're not going to apply until they know. So typically the, the, the borrower is in the permit process and they know about where they are. They're, you know, they're waiting for the county to, to approve or to sign off or they needed to submit one more item. And that's usually the builder takes the lead on that. Builder or architect, um, one or the other will take the lead on that and help the, help the buyer. And then what, is, what, what does the construction loan look like in terms of uh, requirements uh, for the construction loan? Um, also like, uh, uh, debt to income, loan to value, and we can break down mm -hmm. what those are for people just in case they aren't familiar with those. Uh, but what, what does that look like in terms of the construction loan? So first of all, let's talk about loan to value. So um, it's it's a tiered um, approach. So you can, we can go up to a loan amount of 750000 It's 90% loan, loan to value, up to 750000 so one of the other thing that's really important to share is this is for a primary residence or a second home. This is not for investment or for spec housing. It's it's for the the borrower to, to be their primary or second home. We also can do this for a duplex as well, as long as they're going to be residing in, in one of the units. Um, we can do up to 80% loan to value, up to a million five. And then 75% loan to value up to two million. 70% loan to value up to 2.5 million, 65% up to 3 million. Now for those larger loans, we also can take our clients through our private wealth team. And those are higher loan to values, but those are for clients who have a relationship with US Bank, typically a minimum net worth of 3 million. So it sounds like it just kind of depends on what the loan amount that they want and how much they're gonna put down the depending on that. Now, um, whenever we factor in the LTV or, or the the maximum loan amount, let's say it's 90% and let's say it's 750, 
$250,000. If the construction loan pays off the land loan, that could be a combination of the land loan and the construction loan. It just means that the total loan amount would be the $750,000. Fantastic. Correct. Okay, good. And then what about the uh, debt to income ratio? And for our, and, and just to break down the loan to value ratio, that just means that if like, let's say that we're talking about like a 90% loan to value, that means if your, uh, if your property is worth 100,000 after construction, right? Or before construction, after construction, no, so, you'd be able to, no, so okay. Okay. So let's, yeah, it's a good topic. I was just, yeah. So basically what we'll do is we take the value of the land and the materials list, and that's how we're going to come up with our loan to value. We will still order an appraisal, but we are actually going to take that loan to value based on the value of the land and, and your materials list, your cost to build. Okay. So it's not based on like an actual, like after, like what is the property worth um, after it's more based? What is it going to cost to construct? Right. right. Now, if our appraisal comes in lower, we're going to take the lower value and I have not seen it. it typically comes in higher, but we cannot increase that loan to value. We're still going to go off the materials list and the cost of the land. If the borrower has purchased the land in the last 12 months, we're going to take that purchase value. If it's been over 12 months, we're going to get a new appraisal on, on the land. And it sounds like um, during the approval process, you would need a materials list. Is a materials list the same thing as a contractor's estimate? Is, is that basically what, what it is? It is. Correct. Okay. Fantastic. Okay, good. And then do you have any tips and tricks? Because I think this is a big issue. Um, sometimes like I'm building accessory dwelling units uh, on some of my properties and twice I hired the wrong architect and he gave me the runaround for a really long time and it really delayed me like up to a year and a half, maybe even two years during the pandemic. Uh, we finally found one that is really good. But any tips and tricks as to finding the right architects and also finding the right uh, construction people, because I know that's a really important piece of the puzzle. And I also know that because that was so new to me and I didn't understand the process, it was very easy for them to give me the runaround because I didn't know what type of questions to ask. So um, any tips that you'd recommend for hiring the right architect or for hiring the right construction person? Uh, any best practices as it relates to that? I think um, my daughter just went through a major remodel on her house and she faced the same experience. I think you got to look at a couple things. You got to look on social media, see what they're post posting, see what their style is. Um, other people will, will also post and support them. Mm -hmm. um, it's good for that, that feedback. Also the Better Business Bureau, you want somebody that's licensed. The other thing I think is really important in that relationship is you're building a team and you want an architect and a contractor that work well with each other. It's kind of a checks and balance system. So the architect can come up with something and the builder is going to say, yes, this works or, hey, we're going to have an issue here. Same thing. If the builder suggests something, you can talk to the architect and they're going to say, well, this th you're going to have some challenges with this or this isn't gonna work logistically. So I think it's really important that those two work well together. It's a checks and balance system. The one thing I really wanna share though, just, just uh, this came up recently, well, a few years ago with a client. They did a lot of work with an architect. They came up with these plans and they came to me after they had their plans and they were ready to build, but they were trying to build something they couldn't afford. So I also really think there's several steps in construction, more so than when you first buy a home. So I think it's really, really important that you're talking to the banker, you're making sure you understand what your budget is, what you qualify, if you need to come in with cash to close, so that you clearly understand that. And then also that that piece with your with your architect and builder. And it's so important that they have a good relationship and you'll you'll find out. They'll recommend each other or they work well to, together. What are some of the risks associated with building a home versus buying something that's already uh, built? And where my head kind of goes in is, can contractors like change like the price per square foot like halfway through the project? Because I know like during the pandemic, like cost of lumber skyrocketed through the roof. So I'm kind of imagining like, okay, like if cost of lumber increased, like I imagine that some of those contractors 
like would go back to the buyers and would say, Hey, look, this changed. Like, have you ever seen that? And is there anything that the buyers can actually do to kind of protect themselves where uh, it mit uh, mitigates the risk? And are there any other issues that you've kind of seen? Cause I imagine like I get a lot of clients that reach out to us and they're like, Oh, I'm going to buy this piece of land for 200,000. I'm going to build on it. It's going to be 800,000. I'm going to have this property that's got like a million dollars in equity. And it, it, sometimes it doesn't work out that way. So maybe what are some of the things that go wrong in the process or that you've kind of seen go wrong? And then we'll kind of continue with the, uh, the rest of the items as well too. So we do require a fixed contract. And so when we're starting with our clients 90 days prior to breaking ground, we get that materials list from the builder. We know that's gonna change. We're gonna get an updated materials list right before we close to make sure we're all, we're all in line. But I will tell you, the, it was really a struggle November, December, January last year with it, with earlier this year with that supply chain. And I had clients mm -hmm. that they had the materials list. They knew what the windows were going to cost, but they knew it was going to take them six months to get the windows. They would pay for the windows out of pocket. We would add that to our list. We would reimburse the client afterwards, but that way they knew they got the windows, they got them all ordered and knew that they were going to be on their way. So that was one way to do that. We're not seeing, I've not seen or had clients tell me that they're facing that right now, that they're worried about not getting the windows or worried about the cost. I did have a builder last week was concerned about the fixed price, you know, the cost. But um, again, we need that. We need that to, you know, we need something to go on um, for our for our loan process. But we can always get that updated and uh, signed off again to make sure our numbers are are um, in line right before we close the loan. And when you say a fixed cost, that means like they're committing to doing the project at a price without changing that price prior to the close of escrow, basically. And then uh, what does the process look like? Like, let's say that I do end up getting the construction loan. I'm about to finish the construction on it. Do I have to refinance the house in order to uh, get a new interest rate or do I have to refinance out or how does that process uh, work? So our construction loan is considered a one-time close. So you apply for the construction loan. We talk to the contractor. The contractor says, it's going to take me 12 months to build a home. Mm -hmm. Right now in our area, people cannot finish a home in less than 12, 12 months. Um, and once the last draw is taken, we get the certificate of occupancy. Our loan rolls into a permanent loan. So when they sign up for their construction loan, they can choose a 30-year fixed interest rate, a 10-1 arm, a 7-1 arm, a 5-1 arm, and they're going to pay interest only during construction, but once construction's completed, certificate of occupancy, it rolls into the permanent loan. The next month, they'll start paying principal and interest on that loan. So it's really nice. Because this rate, rate environment, the rates just keep going up. Um, you can still get a construction loan under 6% right now. Rates are subject to change. Today is September 29, 2022. So rates can change at any time, but our rates are still very attractive. Um, so the nice thing is you can sleep at night. You know you're paying interest only on your construction loan. It rolls into the permanent loan. Rates are lower. Great. You can refinance. There's no prepayment penalty. Um, you, your, your, your peace of mind because you, you know what your yeah. interest rate is. Yeah. That's awesome. And then uh, in regards to the construction loan, how does the disbursement process work like for contractors? Like, do you guys just give the contractor all the money at once? Um, or is that uh, kind of handled in payment? I think some would like that. Several would like that. No, they can take a disbursement once a month. When we initially close the loan, they can take a maximum of 10% on the initial disbursement and um, they can take a disbursement once a month. So, okay. so basically it's 12 months is pretty common. We can go 18 or 24 months total for construction. That's awesome. And then um, in regards to like the disbursements that they can take a uh, either disbursement once a month. What are some of the protections that consumers have for these disbursements? Does somebody go out there on behalf of the bank and kind of look at some of the work that's been done every single 
a month or is it just, hey, I need more money, send me the the money or what, what does that look like? So, you know, actually that's, that's a really good point because some people have the cash to do construction, but they actually like working with the bank because they're, they do have somebody that's going out and checking and doing inspections. So there's, we have several disbursement agencies that we work with. One is Granite. Um, and they'll, they watch the disbursements. They confirm the funds are going where they're going, that, that the job is at whatever point it should be before they disperse more funds. And then um, this is kind of an interesting question. We did a similar episode like a year ago. Has there been an increase or a decrease in construction loans since then? And then what do you think uh, is attributed to that either way? Well, I don't know if I can answer that as a blanket. I pulled back on construction because the purchase market, the refi market was so busy and construction takes a lot of time. So I pulled back for for a bit because it was just, there was more business than we could do at that, at that point. Right now, I'd say 70% of my business is construction because you and I live in an area that there's not a lot of housing available. Mm -hmm. We're seeing it kind of... Um, open a up a little bit more and we're seeing more on the market, but still mm -hmm. I've got families that are their young families that are looking to buy a home, pretty happy price point, and they're buying something that's pretty, that's dated. So instead they're choosing to build, um, or I've got other clients that they're baby boomers and they're looking at, you know, building their forever home and, uh, want to build exactly what they want. So it's, it's kind of a 50, 50 on, you know, I think if clients could find the home they want, they, they would buy. It's a lot less work, but they're not able to do that. So they're looking to build instead. To build, basically. And then have you seen any changes in price per square foot over the last two years? Like, uh, are the estimates coming in higher than they once were? And I don't know if you would be able to touch on this. Is there kind of like any rules of thumb? Like if a client comes to you and says, hey, look, I've got this builder and he's going to charge me a million dollars, but it comes out to a thousand five hundred price per square foot. Are there any like red flag numbers and kind of where you typically see like the price per square foot? And the reason I ask this is sometimes I get clients coming to me saying, hey, look, I want to do a construction loan. And we have kind of like our rules of thumb as to what we kind of see price per square foot. And we're like, hey, look, once you, fa if you're going to build that type of home and you multiply by the price per square foot, you're going to spend this much in construction, this much plus the land. Um, you're going to be into it for this much. And sometimes when we break it down to them in, in that manner, it allows them to kind of make a decision. Are there certain ranges in price per square foot that you normally see? And viewers, keep in mind, this is in California. This is not in Tennessee. This is not in Indianapolis because... I, I told the price per square foot the other day to somebody from Indy and he's like, man, you could almost buy an entire house for that, you know? So, yeah, well, we have a house in Tennessee, so I know exactly what you're, what, what you know, what you're talking about. So it's really good to point out that this is California, not, not um, Midwest area. So we do the appraisal. So we appraise the plans, but we also have to get comparable home sales in that area that support that value. So no, they're not going to be able, if they come in, in the builder's got something that's you know 700 something a square foot or whatever we're that's just not gonna the bank's not gonna be okay with that so it has to it's just like when you um sell a home it needs to appraise and they get comparable home sales so it's got to be in line right perfect okay good and then um what differences do you see like if i because I, sometimes you get people that uh that have been through the loan process before when buying a home, but they've never been through the land buying process or a construction building process. What do you, what would you say are some of the like differences in that process and what should people expect? Or are there any differences? Meaning like, is it like the same requirements, same length of time, similar credit scores, or what would you say? Yeah. So we require a minimum 680 credit score. And one of the things that I think is really important is it does take longer. There's a few moving parts. So if you have a piece of land and you're going to get a construction loan, don't go out and do grading. Don't do, don't get any work done or it's going to cause 
the process to take longer because we go to t the title company and we need an indemnity agreement, which they say the title's clear, no work's been done, no mechanic fleeing. So the worst thing you can do is think, oh, I'm going to do some of this work ahead of schedule, then come and apply for the construction loan. You're actually going to slow yourself down. Um, so again, it's the construction loan can be done. It's just more work than than a typical home buying process. We got to work with your builder. And what I have found with builders, they are fantastic and they're good at what they do, but they're not always the best at paperwork. So the builder that has somebody in the office that can get things signed for us is great. But the the builder that's a small team and he kind of does it himself. Um, I have found that I can get a hold of them on the weekends or in the evening and say, I really need you to sign this, or I need, you know, I need to get this additional information for you. But again, you know, we're not all things to all people and we're not great at everything. So he's going to be great building in your home, but we just need to get the paperwork done. And that, if I can't get the builder to respond, I'll get the client involved, my buyer involved and have them go out and get whatever we need signed as well. So there's just a few different nuances with the title company. Um, You've got to get insurance, a uh, little different insurance than homeowner's insurance, but it can easily be done. Just know it's a few more steps. And the really important thing is to build a good team. That team is your lender, that team is your builder, your architect, and we'll, walk, you know, we'll get you through the process. I've got a question. I live in Camarillo, and in Camarillo, they were building like this large hotel right off the 101, and then one day it caught on fire. Like what would happen if something did catch on, like, let's say that uh, it caught on fire. Would that be on the contractor? Would that be on the insurance? Would that be like, like what would happen in a situation like that? If you have a loan with a bank on your home, you have to have insurance on your home and insurance is uh, the bank is named as last pay. Same thing with construction. You've got the bank is named if there's something that happens and then also your builder is going to have insurance as well so that way if one of his employees does something um, there's coverage there as well but if there was you know we live in the land of fires here in california so if there's mm -hmm. a fire you have insurance uh, the bank will get paid off whatever the loan is and then the rest would go to the homeowner and then what are some of the fees associated with construction loans like are they very similar to like traditional loans are they more expensive yeah, there's a few more, a few more fees. So basically, with the bank, the bank's fee, there's um, an eight ninety five fee and three ninety five. So let's just say fifteen hundred dollars in fees. But the rest of the fees are going to be your your hard cost. Um, you've got your granite construction, which you're going to pay for the disbursements. You're going to mm -hmm. pay for each disbursement. You know, depending on how long you you take, twelve months, eighteen months. You've got your title and escrow, so it's a, it's a little more expensive than buying a home. You've got your insurance um, appraiser; those fees, uh, hard costs as well. And then, if somebody wanted to go through this process, like, what is the best way for them to find a lender that specializes in this? Like, this U.S. Bank have a, a website where they. Uh, list all of their mortgage or all of their uh, construction uh, loan officers um, and what what any tips that you would give uh, in that aspect. Okay. So U.S. Bank um, pretty much lends all over the U.S. So you can reach out to me. Um, we'll put my contact information on the bottom. I do, I'm working on a loan, construction loan right now in Florida. Hopefully they're, they're okay with that, recent, that hurricane. But also the other thing to look at, what's really important, I think, is the construction products for one-time close because you want to be protected with the, the interest rate. So uh, having a loan that rolls into a permanent loan is, is pretty important right now with, with interest rates increasing. So the other thing that you might want to look for is that look at your community bank, your local bank, your community bank and your credit union could be an option as well. Okay. And I love the fact that you emphasize on having it roll into a permanent because one of my things was like and this was one of my concerns for some clients that we recently sold the house for is like let's say that they start the construction and then they have to refinance once it's done that was my thought uh what if the interest rate is higher now what seemed to be like a really good purchase now could be a lot higher in monthly payments but if it rolls into a permanent loan then it actually uh, locks in your interest rate at the time of the construction, which I really, really like. For all of our viewers out there, if you have enjoyed this episode, make sure to smash 
that subscribe button. And if you feel that this episode will be helpful for a friend, family, neighbor, make sure to hit that share button and send them the link. Uh, thank you so much, Laura, for taking the time to be on the show. And to our viewers, until next time.